This is a continuation of the previous message. That's happened to all of us, you see. We were all in rebellion to God, some of us in more subtle forms, some of us in more outright forms. It's all rebellion against God. If you don't believe on the Son of God, John says, John 3, 36, you're condemned already and the wrath of God is abiding on you. It just abides on you. Whether you're brought up in a good, so-called good setting or a bad setting, the wrath of God is abiding on you. Some of us maybe have experienced it in its outworking more than others. Some of you maybe more than others experienced it in its outworking. So don't forget that. The fact that what you're doing is, is you are subduing, you are covering over those bad times you really had. It's an untruthful unbalanced way of thinking about the past and you're exalting let's say it like this a good time let's say it like this you probably had maybe what um, 300 uh, bad days out of the year and maybe 65 good days in so what do you think about all you can remember is those 65 good days you forgot about the bulk of your existence back then was certainly bad okay we'll come to a second reason why it's wrong to think this way that's all about the past improper untruthful outlook, a biased, unbalanced opinion of the past. Secondly, it's wrong to think this way because we then forget that the present is only temporary. We forget that the present is only temporary. And what I mean by that is if you happen to be experiencing something right now that's not going over so well with you, it's only temporary. Your past life was perpetual. It was just bad times all the time. <clears throat> Even when you got a present, you were jealous because someone got a better one than you. <laughs> you know, even in the good, there was something bad that was happening to you back then. Even when you get praise for something, someone else gets praise more than you or they don't do it the way you would want to have them do it, or whatever. This is Romans chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. You see, if we think this way, it means that we are forgetting what a, a, a temporary setting we are in right now. That is, if we're in something where it's difficult, or really struggling or striving here, we forget how temporary it is. Romans 8, verses 17 and 18. And, of course, the, the conclusion of this, as we'll see here in Romans chapter 8, is that, and that God has promised better things for us in the future. If children and heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we... Well, let me, don't, let me not read over that so quickly, though. We're talking about the privilege of being a Christian. If children... Then let's go back earlier, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We're talking about the privilege of being God's child. If children, then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. And what does he go on to say? I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are just temporary. Because he's going to contrast the present time with that which is still in the future. Those sufferings, he said, of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen. They're not worthy. We're doing a, a disservice. We're dishonoring God. We're dishonoring the great blessings he has promised for us in the future. Amen. Not to think that they are more than, more than worthwhile to experience whatever it is we're having to experience right now. They make it more than worthwhile. They're not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. These sufferings that we're temporarily suffering with Christ, whatever type of suffering it is, sometimes you can find it right on the job. It's just suffering. Someone is hating you and persecuting you for the faith. But you see, that's temporary. One day that'll be over with. That's only temporary. 
We blow these things all out of proportion. We just blow them out of proportion because we're not liking something that's happening right now. We blow it out of proportion and make it as though this is the way it's going to have to be forever and ever. That's a lack of faith. That is a lack of faith. It's a lack of looking at things through the eyes of reality because God's word speaks reality to us and it takes It's blowing things totally out of proportion to get so caught up in this one bad day that you've had that it just then wrecks your whole week and you're assuming this is just the way it's going to be from now on. That is such an unscriptural, illogical way to look at things. You have to look at things like this. Today might have been a bad day for me. This will not last forever. When I say a bad day, there are two different types of bad days. There can be bad days where you've really sinned and you're out of fellowship with God, and even that promises, the Bible promises will come to an end if you'll just repent. Amen. And then there are those other types of so-called bad days where you've not done anything wrong. God's just put you in a certain set of circumstances where he's testing you. You've not sinned. You're not sinning or anything, but you've got people who are hating you. Maybe you're not making enough money. He's put you there not to make enough money. So that might, you could count that as a bad day. Things don't go well that day. By that I mean things break down. You break something that day. You say, all right, now this is a bad day. That won't last forever. Sometimes you hit those little spills in your life where for three or four or five days, everything falls apart. And they break. But you know what? That won't last forever. It really won't. It really won't. I can tell you that because I've gone through those myself. And it just seems like God's curse is resting on your house. Yeah. But those things will stop, and then you'll enter some new, fresh periods where everything just seems to work. Things that weren't supposed to work then seem to work. We have to be mature about these things. And people who are younger in life and younger in the faith sometimes have a great difficulty being mature about this one thing, remembering that don't worry about it today. Don't worry about it. Don't let it get you down today because today is bad. You don't feel good. You've really missed God that day. Don't worry about it in the sense of thinking, of, of painting. You can already paint your whole future if you don't watch out. Satan will paint it for you right in your mind. My life's always going to be like this. And I guess I'm meaning more than that, meaning more than those types of bad days where you sin and you deserve to have a bad day, those days where you haven't sinned. Those times in your life where you have not sinned against God. You are walking in the light as you know it. You're walking in love and in fellowship with him. But you still have your persecutors in persecution, though. You still have these problems that arise. Not things that you've done wrong, but just problems that arise. It takes a mature individual to remember this is not going to last. So what, I'm working a few extra hours right now. This won't last forever. So what you as a wife say, I'm not getting to see my husband as much as I would like. That won't last forever. Just be patient. Just endure. So what, the child isn't getting what they want that day. They might get it next week. Maybe it's not time for them right now. So what that they're not getting it right then? So what's your low on food that day? There'll come a day one day soon when you'll have probably too much food around. That's right. It's so easy just to complain. We don't have enough food. We don't have enough food. And then what happens when you get too much food? You just complain. We've got too much food around here. Just We've got too much food. Oh, for a happy medium somewhere, you know. <laughs> Humans are just basically complainers. Yeah. It's too cold or it's too hot, too long, too short, it's too fat, too thin, something, you know. We just complain. It has to be, I mean, it has to be so perfectly in between. I mean, so perfectly. And few things are really like that. So perfectly in between that we finally, now we can say we're satisfied. It's always a little bit too much or not enough. The car costs too much or it didn't cost enough. Cost too much, you, you lost money. It didn't cost enough, it's just a rattle trap. <laughs> it's always something's too much or something's, not enough. They took too much time or they did it too quickly. Oh, for something right in between. We have to learn to bounce off of those things and not let them bother us and be rejoicing in our salvation. Meanwhile, be grateful for what we have experienced spiritually in the meantime. So what you got one little thing over here physically that's not going the best for you? It'll be gone one day too as well. The thing that you don't want to lose or you don't ever want to leave you is that, that, that counting of your salvation as a privilege. That's what you don't want to go up and down, back and forth. Sometimes you're grateful for it and sometimes you're not. That's what you don't want to waver back and forth. But people are unsteady. And James says one who is like that is a double-minded man. 
and he says what? Don't let that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. It's kind of all or nothing with him. Don't let that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. God just stops his blessings because there's no connection of faith between you and him. There's no appreciation between you and him for what he has done for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, last two verses. Again, 17 and 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Now that expressly states that it's temporary. Mm -hmm. For our light affliction, which, it, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Paul says essentially the same thing in Romans 8, 17 and 18. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, you have to view things in light of eternity, and that's what he's doing here. And four years worth of persecution is like a second in time in comparison to how long you're going to experience a life absent of all persecution, which is in the next life. That'll be the only life that'll be totally absent. And it works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen, and here we go again, are for a moment. They're temporal. Amen. The things which are not seen are eternal. Any one of these people in the Bible could have wondered why God has put me right here in this situation, in this case, and never have known right around the corner. There's nothing they could, have, could do about it, but right around the corner is a tremendously great blessing from God. And I gave an example earlier, the 120, 120, 120, and we don't have any power at all. All we're doing is afraid. We're praying for power, we're praying for whatever he said pray for, the promise of the Father, but we don't have anything. And just, you don't know that you're going to, next morning, it's been nine days, next morning, tenth day, tenth morning, Holy Spirit's going to fall, and you're going to have a power that you never even comprehended was possible before. You never experienced it. You never comprehended power like that before. And they go out and win 3,000 people to the Lord. You never know what is right around the corner. That means the message is you can never stop plowing. You always have to plow. Plow and plow and plow. You can plant while you plow. Just keep one hand on the plow and throw seed behind you. You can be planting. And, if you're and then you can come back by that way later and maybe pluck some of the fruit. You can be reaping. But you can't ever stop plowing though. You have to continue to plow because you don't know what's right around the corner. You didn't know that this, this, you don't know, maybe where you're sitting, right here this morning, this business opportunity is just 18 months away. You don't know that, that this business opportunity is 18 months yeah. away. Yeah. You ought to think of things like that. Yeah. What we're experiencing right now is just temporal and temporary. Because some of you who are in things right now, 18 months prior to that, you weren't thinking of just 18 months from now. And you know when it gets closer to time, then it even is more meaningful. But of course you don't know. You don't know that you're closer to time. You know, next week, something's going to happen, a certain set of circumstances where I'm going to meet this person and they're going to put me in touch with them. Before I know it, look what happened here. And I could have just been complaining and complaining and just have given up on God earlier. That's why you never want to give up. You never know what's right around the corner. 18 months from now, 8 months from now, 6 months from now, All of those miracles in the Bible, they come at a certain time in history, you see. And the people just have to keep on believing up until that time. So let's go on to another and a third and a final reason why it's wrong to think this way. Make sure you see that there's a distinction between all of these. First of all, we said it's an unbalanced outlook on the past. You magnify the good and choose to subdue in your mind thoughts of those times that were bad. Secondly, we said that it shows you're forgetting that the present time is only temporary. And thirdly, false meditation obscures the good things that are happening to you right now. False meditation, that is meditating just on what's not going your way now, obscures the good things that are going your way now. You see, you never have it when 100% of things are going against you. You never have that. You never have that. I guess that would overwhelm any human being if 100% of the, 
of everything in your life was against you. Maybe sometimes it's 75. But it, it's false meditation to think about these 75, this 75%. Not only is that temporary, that's only part of everything you're experiencing right now. What's, what about that other 25%? Maybe you're, you're being attacked in 90% of the area. What about that other 10%? I'm sure there's something somewhere in your life you can find that's good that's happening right now. Why not think about things like that? Why not meditate on that? Instead of looking at the 75 and then saying, well, you know, then you look back on your past life and you say my past is better than what I'm experiencing right now. Hardly. Hardly. Nothing that you experienced back in those earlier days could be better than that. Maybe that 10% or that 15 or 20 or 25, that small percent of your life now where things are going well for you. Nothing ever went that well for you back then. Maybe everything uh, materialistically is just falling in around you, but Maybe you have peace in your heart, though. Amen. So to, to meditate on the wrong thing obscures the fact you've got good things that are taking place right now. In every, in every evil situation, in every trial that you have, in every setback that you have, there's always an advance somewhere else in your life. And a mature Christian will look around to find where that advance is. Instead of thinking about the setback, where's the advance now? I must be advancing somewhere. God must be blessing me somewhere in my life. I'm going to find what's going well for me right now. Let me show you a remarkable passage in Numbers 11. I say this one, verses 1 through 9, because although it does speak of Israel looking back with yearning in her heart and longing in her eyes for the earlier days in Egypt, and thus really calling into question God's present leading of them in the wilderness, not only are they looking back, that's the whole subject of the message, looking back and that's a way of testing whether or not you really count your Christianity as a privilege. Not only is that true, but it's remarkable uh, how they fit in this last category here where false meditation, I said, obscures the good things that are now happening. Listen to this. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord. The Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. People cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched, and they called the name of the place. And so the mixed multitude that was among them fell lusting. The children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember, Ecclesiastes 7.10, looking back to earlier days that were better, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, and the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away, for there is nothing at all but this supernatural bread that God personally and daily sends down from heaven for us. You know, you were... God was giving them an incredible miracle, a daily miracle for 40 years he gave them. I mean, we haven't seen a miracle like that where just bread from heaven it just comes down every day for you. They are overlooking that. They, they've forgotten essentially all about that. Oh, we, we're tired of this. They've forgotten all about... A, a, a daily miracle, six days a week that God gave them. 52 weeks out of the year, 40 long years, God gave them this miracle. And because they magnified the, the evil circumstances they were in right then, because they magnified that, their false meditation obscured the good things that God was doing for them. It seems, all, you know, you read the passage and you almost say to yourself, that's impossible. I mean, it wasn't just like I had to kind of look in my life and kind of find something that's good somewhere. This was something that couldn't be denied. You saw it happen with your eyes every morning when you woke up. You couldn't deny this miracle. Amen. And yet you obscure that. It's totally obscure. The blessing that that is intended to bring is, is totally wiped out in your life because you're thinking about the wrong thing. You're thinking about the wrong thing. We go back to all these recent messages. Where is the battle won or lost? I won't give you four guesses. It's in your mind. It's when that's where the battle is won or lost. It's in your mind. What you choose to think about. Here's good things going for them. My point in looking back here at this passage, if they, by by their by their willful sin and disobedience, if they could overlook such a tremendous, undeniable miracle of God for them every day. 
don't you think it would be much easier for you to overlook all these things that you have to search for that are good in your life? It's going to even be easier for you to fall. I don't see how I could ever fall, but I guess it's possible if it happened to Israel. You know, we'd like to think of God. If I got up and I went out on my lawn and there was a loaf of bread that came from heaven every morning, I know I'd never complain against God again. If I could see a miracle like that happen every day, I know I'd never forsake him. Miracles, not necessarily. It's all in your mind. It's all in your own heart. They lack gratitude in their heart here. That's a big problem they have. They lack gratitude. They're not thankful for at least the bread God has given. It's not sirloin. It's not fresh seafood for them. It's not a pot full of vegetables like they're looking for. It's not some good fish out of the Red Sea. It's just bread. But after all, it's something. Why not be grateful for the something that you have? Amen. And it's not just something. It is, it is the food of the mighty. King James says, angels' food came down from heaven. God's bread, God's manna that he sent down from heaven. And remember, there's no way we can say now this is just something that happened naturally over there in the desert because whenever it comes time for Sabbath day, there's no manna. Manna falls for six days. On the sixth day, you gather twice enough to last you through the Sabbath day, the seventh day. And some went out on the Sabbath day to get some anyway, which displeased God. Did they find any? It wasn't there. So nothing there at all. It was a daily miracle, six days a week. I would like to think if God would just, if I would just open a desk drawer. I mean, if I put a lock, a key, guard dogs, booby trap the whole room so I know no one can get in there. And every time I go in there, there's a fresh hundred dollar bill in my top desk drawer I know that's God giving it to me and I never complain again yes you would too you would even even if you knew God created that money and put it there we'd get it in the morning and forget about it that night because we spent it in the afternoon (laughs) something would happen that would cause you to go back on God then or 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 what would happen to you uh like what happened to Israel you'd complain what's only a hundred why not two hundred here See, they complain it's only bread. You know, why not some of these other things here? They should have at least been grateful for the bread that they had. It's remarkable how when you start meditating on the wrong thing, your mind just, it becomes perverted then. It obscures all of these good things that are happening right now. So what if you had to eat bread for 40 years? That's all that you had. They had quail too, but let's just say they had to eat bread for 40 years. You ate it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What a privilege. No other human being on earth has eaten bread specially made in heaven sent down to you. No other human being in history has ever been able to do that. Again, put yourself literally and historically back in a position like that. Yeah, you might get a little old, eat bread all the time, but not if you thought, I'm being given something that no other human being in past history or current history or future history will ever be able to have again. God is doing a unique miracle here, raining bread down out of heaven. Oh. And I'm complaining against this. Don't like the taste of it. Moses goes on to explain that it kind of tasted good. <laughs> the manna, they said there's nothing beside this manna before our eyes. The manna was as coriander seed, the color thereof as the color of bedellium. The people went about and, well, we're not told here, but if you go over, I think it's to Exodus 16, you go over there and you find out that it tasted like honey and wafers. Sounds pretty good. Nice cookie in the morning. The people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills or beat it in mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. The taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. I'm giving another taste of it here. Fresh oil, wafers. It looks like a precious metal, a precious stone here. (laughs) We'll never get to taste it, that's for sure. Not as it was given there in the wilderness. You just have to conjure up in your mind. Uh, we need a chief chef to bake up all of this for us and make it the right color and <laughs> taste it and see now, now what does that taste like it's got to be just like this we're given enough information so that we know it didn't taste like a cane wood that they were gnawing on or something <laughs> they made the ark of the covenant out of that and then god gave them bread instead of a cane wood because if he just said man i wonder what does it taste like maybe they were justified in complaining about it maybe it just tasted horrible and god made them eat it anyway well it still would make them justify you realize but God goes on to say it did taste good for them. It had a good flavor to it. You could use it for different things. They gathered it, ground it, mills, beat it in a mortar, baked it. You could do different things with it. 
You can make it into this shaped cake or this little patty or this little wafer or this little cracker or this little loaf of bread. You can do a lot of different things with it. God did give them variety. Some people think it was just a little piece of bread. You just went like a wafer at communion stick in your mouth. And it was nothing different. <laughs> but we're told here in Numbers 8, 11 that they could do different types of things with it. It was of that substance where you can mold it and make it and turn it into different types of things. I don't know. Probably that would change the flavor. You know, depending on whether you cook something on top of the stove or in the oven or it's frozen when you make it or something or it's chilled or it's warm it has different flavors. So maybe it has different flavors. Maybe that's why sometimes it's described as tasting like fresh oil, sometimes like a wafer, a coriander seed described under different figures here. They had variety. They still complained. Verse 9, when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. It wasn't dew, it fell upon the dew. You think that the dew, you know, if you put bread out in water, it just turns soggy, you wouldn't want it. The dew fell, the manna fell on top of it, and somehow they went and scraped it all up and gathered it together in baskets and beat it and ground it and cooked it and turned it into flour and turned it into cakes. And what's our point? Oh, they've forgotten all about this. Oh, they see it, really, they have forgotten about it because they're complaining about it because of the fact they don't have any vegetables to go along with it. It's, it's back to the old subject of gratitude. You have to be grateful. You have to learn to be grateful for exactly Amen. what you have. Amen. And you know, just what you have is so much more, you've heard it before, but you, you can hear it again, it's so much more than so many people in the world have. Right. Amen. Do you realize what it means to be able to, we don't take pride in this, maybe as we should, take, take pride, maybe I should say be grateful for it, would be a better way to say it, because we're not a God and country church and a God and country ministry here like a lot of people are, but you are a citizen of the United States. You're a United States citizen. People almost give their lives to become a United States citizen. And that's something other Christians don't get. I was telling someone this just yesterday. I said, do you realize what a privilege it is to be a United States citizen? You can go around boldly proclaiming, thank God, I am a United States citizen. I mean, that is, I, I was really meditating on that a few days ago. I am a united, because since we're not God and country church in a God and country environment here, you just kind of forget about politics and countries and my citizenship is in heaven anyway. But we also have a citizenship down here. And what, what pride in, in, in thanking God we should have. We are united. We're looking around at fellow Americans here, citizens of the United States of America. It will go down in history as one of the greatest nations that ever existed. Amen. The United States of America, and you're a citizen of it. Hallelujah. With all the privileges, with all the benefits, we get to worship here freely this morning. Amen. Freely we get to worship here. Amen. All the privileges that we have. You see, we do have a lot to be grateful for, not only as being a Christian, but God made us a Christian here in the United States of America. And I was telling someone again, I guess that was yesterday. I said, and God has given us a good man as our president right now. You know, there are bad presidents and good presidents. He's a good man. He has turned around the economy of this country. We need to be grateful for that. We went and filled our big old huge car up out there. I mean, it was below empty is how empty our car was. Twelve dollars. I mean, that's been a long time since we filled a car up. That size car. <laughs> with a tank it has for $12? I remember just a short while ago, it was you had to have a 20 and a few ones to fill your car up in. 69 cents a gallon. We ought to be grateful for that, you see. When <laughs> Over a year's time period, you save hundreds of dollars just because the economy has been turned around here in this country. We have a president who's come in and done something about certain things in this country. We need to be grateful. We need to be thanking God for that man and praying for that man. He's not going to be around much longer. They only let him stay there two times. Only two times. Those other guys stayed too many times, you see. They had to invent new laws. It's just time and time and time again, and here we finally uh, elect him again, and Roosevelt dies on our hands. Here We didn't even know he was sick. Had his sickness hidden, and we elect him, and he dies on our hands here. Now, there's only two terms here. We're going to... We're going to have some new fella come on the scene here in just a few years. Now, what's he going to do for us? 
turn the economy back around and send us back into a repression or depression again? No, we're not God and country. We're just God. But God has given us our country here. Amen. I'm not proud of the United States of America, but I'm very grateful that I am born here, that I was born here, that I live here. So far, I've not been required to move from this country. <laughs> You see the recent article in one of these magazines or newspapers, I forget where I read it, uh, the, um, uh, the people from Cuba and down there trying to get to Florida, and there was a group of them that had tied themselves to inner tubes, tied themselves to inner tubes, because you know you're going to be hit by storms and everything, it's a 75 mile trip, and they, hit, they were hit by two storms, they lost all their food, lost their, their um, uh, radio. Uh, their battery-powered radio that they had, and they were just surrounded by sharks and without food and water for three days, I believe. What were they trying to do? Get to this country to become a United States citizen. Just trying to get here. Lace yourself, tie yourself to some inner tubes so that the storms won't sweep you off of them. They were hit by two storms and just, you know, cover them with water. But those inner tubes would always bounce back up out of the water again. You're trying to do that, and you didn't have to do anything. Not a thing to be born here. Great. Just your parents gave you birth. It wasn't your choice. You had nothing to say or do about the matter. Um, you were born here. Would you make an attempt like that to come to this land of the free and the home of the brave here? Sharks surrounding you. You've been without food and water three days. Maybe the tide's going to turn and the wind's going to turn. It's going to blow you out into the Atlantic instead of blow you from Cuba up to the uh, southern tip of Florida. How do you even know the wind's going to blow and the water's going to go in the right direction to get you there? Three days, no compass, no food, no water, no radio, and you're being s surrounded by sharks in the water. And you've got yourself tied with, with thongs there onto some, some tires, some inner tubes, trying to get to this country. And so we just, we need to, we need to take notice of this, dear friends. We just wake up in the morning, just we're an American citizen. We're an American citizen. You get a, a passport that says you are a United States citizen. And you get to go travel in all these junky countries and you get to come back home again. The average wage of so many of those people over there is a couple of hundred dollars a year. A couple of hundred a year. You can, you can make that in a week. You can make that maybe in one good, hard, long day. Yeah. One day. Some people in this country make that in, in one, what, no, one moment. Some of these superstar athletes, they get paid, you know, $50,000 a day. You start dividing it out for moments, I mean, you're making lots of hundreds of dollars just for every moment you live. And they always complain that they're not getting paid enough. Yeah. <laughs> You're paid, you're paid every waking and sleeping moment. I mean, how would you like that? You're paid $200 every waking and sleeping moment of your life. $200 a moment, whether you're awake or asleep, whether you're at work or at play. $200 a moment. Oh. Some of them make $200 a year. We need to be grateful that we're saved and that God has put us here in this country. Amen. Now, I guess you say, well, what if we were preaching and living in Yugoslavia this morning? I guess we'd say... That we're grateful that we were born here in this country. I guess we'd be grateful because God is the one that calls us to be born there as well. Amen. So I guess I'd be saying the same thing. But just compare and contrast the things that we have with what other people have. It's such a privilege to know Jesus and such a privilege to be saved. Such a privilege to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Isaiah chapter 53, I guess, gives us another Another reason there that, that we, should, we should look to for why, why we are so privileged, and that, of course, is because it cost God his only son to provide for us our salvation. Isaiah 53, 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And yet the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 
Isaiah 53, 10, but yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him for our sake. And God the Father, in, in, his, in his tremendous love, his infinite love for us, bruised his Son so that he could set us free. His Son became captive, you see, to death for three days that we might be set free from death and live an abundant life. He came down living anything but an abundant life in his earthly ministry. And he said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. He didn't have that. He didn't have more abundantly. He had more abundantly back in heaven. He left glory whenever he left heaven and he Praise to the Father in John 17, I'm coming back to that glory, that place of glory where I was before. He lived three and a half years when he lived the whole time, 33 years, but I mean walking around in his ministry three and a half years with nothing but opposition. He experienced opposition so that we could be set free. He experienced death. He tasted death for every man, Hebrews chapter 2, so that we don't have to taste death. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're privileged to be saved. How in the world could anyone look back on their life and say, oh, I wish I was a banker instead of a Christian. I wish I had my earlier life so I wouldn't have ended up where I'm ending up right now as a Christian. <coughs> people that think like that are people that are not grateful for God and God probably will do nothing for that person. God will do nothing for them. We have to be grateful just on the bare minimum of what we have. And that's the greatest thing that he's given us, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. If you die a hermit, you die penniless, you die sick, you still have Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, as your King, as your Master, as your Heavenly Friend, as your Counselor, as your Advocate, as your Intercessor, Regardless of whether you have anything else at all or not, you have that. You have him. The Bible teaches, dear friends, when we have him, we do have it all then. When we, when we are in Christ Jesus, we have everything that is in him. And that is the fullness of the Godhead. There's a big thing to, to comprehend in the fact that we are in Christ Jesus. Paul always is writing about us being in Christ Jesus. Well, what else is in Jesus? If we're in him, we have what is in him. What else is in him? The fullness of the Godhead. The fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus Christ. Right. And we have that. That means we have peace, we have joy, we have long-suffering. That means we have all that God has then. We have that. The potential is there. It's a question of our will, whether we choose to bring it forth and to manifest it. We have God's Holy Spirit living in us. We have all of those gifts, all of those ministries. All of that is there available for us, just to use, just to use. There are gifts given to us. People turn these things around like God's trying to force them to do something. They're gifts. You don't force a gift on someone. It's a gift. People turn it around and turn it into bondage then. God's trying to make me do this. God's forcing this on me. It's all a gift. The Holy Spirit is a gift. Speaking in tongues is a gift. The gifts of the Spirit are gifts. Our salvation is a gift. Forcing something upon us in bondage and legalism, it's all a gift. He's trying to force me to serve him. It's a gift to be able to serve him. It's a privilege to be able to serve him. What do you mean he's forcing me to follow him? He's forcing me to walk the deeper life. He's forcing me to commit myself to discipleship. It's a privilege to be able to commit yourself to discipleship. Very, very, very few people can do that because God doesn't give them the grace. All oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his ways and his judgments past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? Who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul just breaks forth in that doxology in the last three verses of Romans 11 because of his great praise for what God has done in saving Jews and saving Gentiles and sending Jesus Christ into the world. 
in nailing him to a cross, Galatians 3.13, and making him to become a curse for us that we might be released from the curse. And then we say, oh, the, but the former days were better whenever I was an airline pilot or mechanic. Oh, the former days were better. No, they're not either. Amen. Ecclesiastes 7.10, you, you don't think wisely. That's an unjust way of thinking about things for these reasons that we've given you. You're forgetting about the good that you have now. You're forgetting about the bad that you had back then. You're forgetting about what the future holds for you. God said, over in the book of Job to Job that your latter end will be greater than your former end. Your latter end will be greater than your former end. In John chapter 2 in the miracle of turning the water into wine and at the wedding feast there of Cana of Galilee it's interesting how Jesus saved the best for last. Remember he made the wine better than the wine they had before and the governor of the feast said, now this is unusual. Most people bring out the best wine first so that once we all have become drunk with that then we won't taste. We don't know whether the later wine is good or bad. It's best to bring your bad wine out later so no one knows. You can use all your cheap stuff up, all your stale stuff up then. I mean, who's going to bring their worst first and then bring their best later on? That's what Jesus does. You start, out, start off down lower, you end up higher then. But you know, Jesus gives uh, an interesting teaching along the same line of what we're talking about of trying to put new wine into old wine skins. Those that are always saying, oh, the old was better. The old was better. Looking back for those former days, he said, those people are incapable of receiving the new wine. He said, if you want to have new wine, new wine has to go in new wine skins. New wine can't be put in old wine skins. Because of the process of fermentation, it's going to expand. And if it's, if it's old and brittle, which is, an old, which is what an old wine skin would be like, old and brittle, the fermentation process of the wine causes the whole thing to expand. It's going to burst it then. You're going to have a new one made out of freshly cut leather, freshly cut sheepskin that's still pliable so that as the fermentation process sets in and the wine begins to expand the bag, the, ba the bag will have the, the elasticity to it so that it itself can begin to expand. There's the problem. You try to put something new in old people, it breaks, he says, it spills, the wine is lost, and then the bottle is marked. You have to put it in something that's new. Why? So that the new person, if they're a new person, they can grow with the growth of God. They can grow with the blessings of God. Amen. That's a test of whether a person is the right type of person or the wrong type of person. As God adds to us new and better wine, are we able to handle that? We're able to grow with that without having seams breaking all over us and the wine spilling out and our bottles, our lives being marred by that. If we're the new person that he's made us to be, we have the, the principle of expansion in us then. Ephesians chapter 2 again, we are able to increase with the increase of God. Maybe that's Colossians chapter 2. I believe it's Colossians chapter 2. We are able to increase with the increase of God. So remember what he said in that one parable, that one illustration there. He said, no one, he gives it in two different forms, one the form I've just said and one the form that I mentioned earlier, where he said, no one who's ever tasted the old wine wants any of the new wine because they say the old is better. The old is better, the old life. Once you start going back and tasting of the old life and the old way, it happens to people. I've had it happen right with people that I've been very, very close to. You start saying to yourself, yes, the old wine does taste better. The old wine tastes better than the new wine. And you just get so intoxicated on that old stale stuff that if God tries to give you anything new or fresh or good, it means nothing to you. The same principle of how can you give a man a drink of water who's not thirsty? How can you fill a man who's not hungry? You already have it. Oh, the old is better. I don't want anything new right now. We have to always be looking for something new and counting this walk that we're in such a privilege oh, and not always looking back on what I missed out on. God has so much for us. You know, it's just like what he said to the disciples. He has to say to us, Oh, ye of little faith, why do you doubt me? Oh, ye of little faith, why do you doubt me? I have so much more for you in the future I'm not going to tell you about right now. 
you're going to have to live this Christian walk a step at a time. But do you think God has worse things planned for us in the future? No, he doesn't. God's got better things planned for us in the future. Better in everything than what you're experiencing right now. And so his word to us is, O ye of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Thinking God is surely bringing me into the wilderness to slay me here. God has surely brought me to the Red Sea to slay me in the Red Sea. No, he hasn't either. He's brought you there to give you a victory and to teach you something through that. Oh, there's the huge Red Sea before you. You're going to get victory over that and you're going to learn something through that. Chiefly, you're going to learn how faithful God is. Amen. How faithful he is. Hallelujah. And how much sweeter the victory is if you go over in victory and not have to have Moses come along and help you get the victory to get across the Red Sea. Think what the Israelites could have done if they all would have come to the Red Sea and all had been in the right frame of mind and all had the right attitude about what was going on. They had to get some help from Moses getting the victory. God gave them the victory not for their faith, but for Moses' faith and for Moses' obedience. That's the only way they got over. And he continually is giving them things because of Moses' consecration and Moses' discipline in his life, Moses' obedience. And finally, when you finally get to Numbers 14, he says, that's it. He said, they spoke in my ears the fact that they will die in the wilderness and their bodies will become carcasses there. He said, that's exactly what shall happen to them then. There just comes a time where intercession for them did no good. Moses, every time, would fall down on his face and pray and pray and pray. And God would tell him, don't pray for this people. I'm going to destroy them and raise up a nation through you. And, God, and Moses would say, no, Lord. He'd pray and remind him of the promises to the fathers. And God would do what Moses asked. But there finally came a time, he said, all oh, under the age of 20 who have complained and murmured against me in this wilderness will surely die here. Talk about a negative confession and getting what you're talking about is because it's an expression of that's what your heart is saying, that's your will, not just what you said. Surely will die, that's what you thought. That was an expression of you, that's what you got. Caleb and Joshua go over because they stay with the word. Surely God will give us the victory. Numbers 14, surely the inhabitants of this land will become food. They'll become our bread for us. And they did. Read the book of Joshua. They certainly did. Of course, we could even say there in Joshua and Judges, they could have even become more bread if the people would have obeyed. What did God say? Go in and drive them out. They went and drove them out a little bit. They didn't drive the rest of them out. Judges 2 then, God says, okay. I did say I'd drive them out. Now I'm not going to drive them out. I'm going to leave them there to test you and to prove you, to see whether or not you're going to love the Lord and serve only him. And they failed their test. They served the gods and the nations that they should have driven out to begin with. God was there in power. Look at Jericho. God was there in power. No problems at Jericho. I mean, there's one place in Israel, and there's one place in the Bible, and you think about this, there's few in the Old Testament. Perfect obedience right there. Perfect obedience. The walls come down. After the victory... Now we have sin. Achan keeps something after the victory. And then you have the problems in the next chapter, Judges chapter, or Joshua chapter 7. That's rare in the Old Testament, if you think about it, where, uh, where Israel gets a good victory and she's just totally in obedience with the Lord. You have a few up there with Jehoshaphat and others like that, but they're rare when the whole congregation obeys the Lord. And when they do, look at the blessings. Amen. Look at the blessings that they get. I want to close with a few verses over in Ephesians chapter 2. What a privilege it is to trust Jesus and to know him this morning. Amen. To be saved, to be able to communicate with him and to love him. Ephesians 2. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past ye walked. Here's Paul's thinking about former days and he's got a right outlook on former days. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's what Paul thinks about former days. It's all right to look back on former days. Don't look back on them in an unbalanced or an unjust fashion. That's what Ecclesiastes 7.10 has reference to. Among whom also we all had our life in times past. Now he's back to times past. He just said time past in verse 2. We're in time past. Now verse 3. We had our life in times past. In the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, 
and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Amen. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, intervened in our life, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. One morning, one afternoon, one evening, one night, long ago, you were saved, you were converted, and you need to, never to forget that. Praise that should God. never be forgotten, forgotten the day that you were saved, when you were converted, what God did for you then. The day he baptized you in the Holy Spirit and gave you a new language of praise and utterance. You should never forget that day. You should never forget that time that he gave you. Whenever he sent you here to this church and made you a part of what's going on here, you should never forget that. Amen. He's put you in a place where he can instruct you himself about himself Amen. through his word that you're learning here. Amen. We should never forget that. We should be so grateful for what God has done for us. Amen. Having that attitude of gratefulness is always the remedy. It's always the remedy to the life of complaining like most people live. You'll, you'll count your blessings and you'll name them one by one. You'll remember God has done great things for me. God has done great things for me and even in times like now or whenever you're thinking your life is not going so well, even in those times, I can still look and at least find 10 or 15 or 20 percent of my life is nothing but good. Nothing but good. Good that I never had before. Even with this defeat or that failure over there, look at all the good that I do have now. Well, Father, we just thank you this morning with hearts filled with praise, hearts filled with thanksgiving for Jesus Christ, the one that you bruised, the one that you smote for us, the one that you afflicted for our good. In your mystery, somehow it pleased you to bruise him for us, to make him sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. We praise you with our heart. We praise you in the feeble fashion that we can and that we do with our lips and with our heart, with our mind, with our attitude, with our life to you. We praise you for the wonderful works that you've done in our life. We praise you. We believe you. We trust you. We have faith in you. We believe your hand is on us. We believe you're watching over us for good and not for evil. We believe that better times are in our future for us. We believe that you're bringing us always from, from one level of glory to another higher level of walk with you. Oh, Lord, we repent of all of our complaining and our Amen. distrust of you. We repent of all of those abominable sins. We ask that the precious blood of Jesus cover them from your holy eyes. We never have a right to complain about anything in this life because of all that you've done for us. So we repent of all of that iniquity in our life, that lawlessness and rebellion, of ever complaining against you about anything. Your ways are good ways. Everything that you do is good and right and just and fair. Amen. And how good you've been to us and saving us and letting us, even in this life, just begin to partake of what fellowship with God is really all about. What it will be like in the next life. And how we thank you for the precious Holy Spirit that we dare not quench or grieve or blaspheme. But we love the Holy Spirit as, as the current minister of the church for 2,000 years. The sovereign agent in the church is the blessed Holy Spirit. May we just continue to know him, to praise him, to bless him, and through our praise and exaltation of him, may we also praise Jesus Christ, the one whom he has come to testify about. 
We praise you, Father. We praise you, Jesus Christ, the Son. We praise you, blessed Holy Spirit. I will praise thee, yes, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I will praise thee, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy words, and that my soul not right words. Marvelous are thy words, and that my soul not right words. I will praise thee. I will praise thee, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 